New York. Welcome to the American Theatre Wing Seminars on Working in the Theatre. These seminars are coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York on 42nd Street, right in the heart of Times Square. This is where the theatre is. Off-Broadway, off-off-Broadway, and Broadway mixes here on 42nd Street. And that wonderful mix goes out across the country, and that which is wonderful across the country comes back into New York. So here it is, the heart of the theater. Speaking of mixes, the talent that has come to the Wing seminars come because of the background of the Wing. It was a training school. It, the Antoinette Perry Tony Awards were established to reward not the best in the theater, but the achievement of excellence in the theater. And it continues so today. The seminars that the wing produces are for that purpose. They share their knowledge, the very best that we can find, those that have achieved excellence, those that have trained for it, and those who have received it in the theater are able to share their knowledge, not only between themselves, but with each other. I'm Isabel Stevenson. I'm president of the American Theatre Wing, and this is but one of the programs of the Wing. We are a year-round organization, and we are devoted to serving the community through the theatre. We send shows to hospitals, to veterans' hospitals, to the Actors' Fund home. We also support a program called the Saturday Theatre for Children, which I think is one of the most pro important programs that I can think of. At the elementary school age, children line up on Saturday mornings and they buy a ticket to see a professional live show. No child is turned away, but these children learn to make a commitment at a very early age of what it is to go to the theater. And that's the important thing. When they grow and they buy their own tickets for the theater, they're going to buy a ticket as a discriminant viewer not for the hit show, not just for a birthday or an anniversary. They're going to come to the theater as a need, and that's the importance of the theater. It provides a, a magic for everybody. And we at the American Theater Wing are so pleased to be able to be part of that. And I'm terribly grateful, terribly pleased that this audience that comes to us at the Graduate Center, and internally grateful for the people who are part of our panelists. There is so much to be said and there is such a wonderful mix on this stage that I'm going to turn it over to our co-moderators as quickly as I possibly can. Jean Dalrymple, who is a producer, an author, a publicity woman, and also a member of the board of the American Theatre Wing. Brendan Gill, who is a critic and a member of the board of the American Theatre Wing, will act as co-moderators and they will in turn introduce the panelist, and I will sit and listen quietly and prod them along with some questions if I need to. Thank you very much for being here. Brendan? Thank you very much. Uh, I would introduce first on, on my uh, far right, Teresa Merritt, uh, who is playing a great force of nature, Ma Rainey, in Ma Rainey's uh, Black Bottom. You cannot imagine the amount of uh, energy uh, that is released on that stage. It is absolutely volcanic. She knows exactly what she wants to have happen in her life in that play. And it's a thrilling uh, play for everybody to see. Great, great evening indeed. Uh, her credits on Broadway in the past include Carmen Jones, Golden Boy and the Wiz, and on the road, Hallelujah Baby, Showboat, Funny Girl, South Pacific. Uh, she, she's done, of course, a lot of work in regional uh, theater and on television and received an Emmy nomination for All About Mrs. Merritt. Uh, Ms. Merritt. Uh, then on my immediate uh, right is uh, Joe Mantegna, who is playing in uh, Dungarry, Glenn Ross, uh, received a, a Tony featured uh, actor uh, nomination for that uh, uh, role. He plays the very tough, spunky, hard-boiled uh, salesman, 
and I, who am infinitely suggestible, would have bought anything he had offered to sell me, no matter how perfectly terrible it was. Probably, in his case, it would have been a lot in Florida underwater, and I would have been grateful, uh, I felt grateful to have received it. Uh, Joe has played in, in uh, A Life in the Theater, The Disappearance of the Jews, has toured in Europe and the United States, and is the co-author of Leonardo opening uh, this card says, sometime uh, in, in Los Angeles. That sounds uh, uh, un unnervingly uh, indefinite. We'll have to find out more about that. Jean? Sometime. Beginning on my far left, we have a young lady who is a debutante on Broadway, believe it or not, although we all know her from films and TV and off-Broadway, but this is her first Broadway appearance. She's in Hurley Burley, and her name is Sigourney Weaver. And uh, I will read what, she, what it says. So these cards are wonderful. It's the first time we've had them. <laughs> 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 she, she's off Broadway. She, she was in uh, Titanic, Beyond Therapy, Betty and Boo, uh, Gemini, Marco Polo Sings a Solo. And then she, uh, she wrote, she's a co-author of Das Lusitania Songspiel. I remember that. Very that good. was a, a Brecht parody and very amusing, oh, very well done. Congratulations. And uh, then in films, of course, we've all seen her. She was in Ghost Breakers. The, <laughs> 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 the Year of Living Dangerously, Eyewitness. <laughs> Uh, an alien. <laughs> no, we'll see. Ghostbusters. <laughs> it's the same thing. <laughs> yes, <we're the> <laughs> Jean likes to speak correct English. Under any yeah. Breakers. Right. <laughs> uh, she graduated from Stanford University and also from the Yale Drama School. And then next to her is a, an adorable actress that I saw in the two Royal Shakespeare plays that are here. Uh, she's an absolutely radiant Beatrice, and then she's an adorable Roxanne in, in <laughs> Cyrano de Bergerac. And she, she's one of the people you can really hear in that huge <laughs> gift from <the> theater. <laughs> she speaks distinctly and clearly and in that beautiful British accent that we all love over here. And she, she has the most remarkable background in Shakespeare. I think only in the Royal Shakespeare could it have happened to an actress. She, she's been in Taming of the Shrew, <coughs> of course, Much Ado, uh, uh, Measure for Measure, Merchant of Venice, uh, As You Like It, and Richard III. And she tells me she's been six years with the company. And isn't it marvelous that she's been able to play all of those parts? As I said to her outside, it would be impossible here in America, and it's a great pity. Uh, I'm really sorry. Uh, and her name is, uh, is one of those Irish first names, like Siobhan McKenna, which was always difficult for me. This is and, even worse. And this is <laughs> Sinead Cusack. Is that correct? Yes, said? you said. Good. <laughs> <laughs> well read. And right next to me is Frank Langella. I'll say that immediately because I've known him for many years and always just loved his work. Uh, I particularly liked him when he crawled out of the sea in the seascape. And he was so beautiful to look at. <laughs> it says was on the card. <laughs> Would you like to read the card? <laughs> no, no, no. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be fitting. <laughs> um, then um, uh, he's, um, well, of course, he's, everybody remembers him in Dracula. He was terrific, not only on the stage, but also in the film. And, uh, and then he was in Amadeus. He was the first American Salieri. And he was in Passion. Oh, I loved doing that. That was really wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then more recently in Design for Living at Circle in the Square. Uh, awfully good and very amusing. A good comedian. Uh, he's been in many, many films. And I remember him particularly in Diary of a Mad Housewife. She's still reading? <laughs> now, this is the serious part. 
He's, uh, he, he had a Tony, he was awarded a Tony for uh, uh, Seascape. And uh, he's had two Drama Desk Awards, three Off-Broadway Awards, a Los Angeles Drama Critics Award, National Society of Film Critics Award, and Delia Austrian Medal from the Drama League. Which That's I have in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> And now, now what is I he in can... right now? Hmm? What are you? What oh, are you... oh um, <laughs> uh, he's in After the Fall, oh. the, the Miller play, yes. and which is a, a really wonderful revival. I liked it much, much better than the original production. I thought we were going to announce your nuptials in the <laughs> <laughs> Would you two like to be alone for a little while? <laughs> I, I feel we're gratuitous here on the stage. I, I, if, if, if I might, Isabel, I'd like to ask you right off the bat, what about this Leonardo? I'm always interested in an <laughs> actor or writing. Did it come and go? Yeah, it came and went, as uh, uh, is often the case with uh, theater, as we all know. Um, it was a project about Leonardo da Vinci, but actually it was something that someone else had originally written, and a friend of mine obtained the producing rights to it, and along with the producing rights, the ability to do, really do anything you wanted with it, and he came to me in California, where I normally reside. And, and when one lives in California as an actor, you have a lot of free time on your hands. <laughs> so it was one of those times where I just I had nothing to do, and it seemed like an interesting project. So for about a year, I worked on it and played around with it. But then I got involved with Glengarry, and I really couldn't um, stay involved with it anymore. So I turned the script over to them. And so for the past six months, I, I really don't quite know what happened. Um, so the, the, the show was done, and it ran for a short time, and it closed. But um, the best thing about it is I, I got to meet Chuck Mangione, the, um, the musician, and he created the score for the play. And if nothing else, it just shows how with this business, uh, regardless of how sometimes the work goes, you know, what, that, that always gonna, is going to come and go. But the, the, the people you meet along the way, I find, usually is about the most important thing that ultimately comes out of any... Uh, play or film situation. And so the, the, the friendship I've since made with Chuck really has made, was probably the most valuable thing that came out of the whole project. I mean, last week I flew up to Rochester for his parents' 50th wedding anniversary, and that was probably as exciting for me as the producing of the whole piece. I think that's very true of theater, that, that there's no such thing as a failure in the theater, because the, the relationships that are established, no matter what happens. I, years, many, many years ago, I was the co-author of a play on Broadway that died like a dog in the street after three days. <laughs> uh, and it richly deserved to do so. It was a terrible play. But we had wonderful people in it. Richard Basehart, newly dead, Kevin McCarthy, Mildred Natwick, uh, uh, and, and Directed by Harold Clerman, uh, stage starred by Joe Milzino, all the classic people. Robert Whitehead was the producer. Well, we all adored each other. It was just like Gene and Frank here. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't make a particle of difference that we were all members of this primordial catastrophe, and we've been beloved friends ever since. So that's a very true thing. And, and, and in one's record, in, in theater, uh, to have written a play is to have written a play without regard to whether or not it's a success or a failure. And to have acted in it is, a, is itself a, a great victory, and I think that's a thrilling thing. Now, are you too an, an eager to be a writer as well as a performer, or, have, or are you not? I don't seem to have the time, but I think I will. I, um, so far, I have a very good memory, and many people say that I should write, because I've been in the theatre 40 years. Oh my goodness. I celebrated it uh, in May of this past year. I came here 40 years ago uh, in Carmen Jones. Mm -hmm. I opened at the Broadway Theater at 53rd and Broadway. And, um, and I've loved every minute of it. I just love theater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I have so many anecdotes in my head. And I think that ought to start to write them yeah. down because the older you get sometimes you do get a little dim <laughs> and forget. And they are kind of funny. And um, even now, <laughs> <laughs> I think I should put them down. I would like to write just memoirs yeah. of things that have happened to me in my life. It's been a rich life in the theater, and I invite anybody who want to come in, just come on in. <laughs> Don't come in with the idea of thinking about making a whole lot of money, because it isn't a whole lot of money. I think it's just about coming in and, and uh, because you love it, and, and to improve your, your craft, 
And I think that to, at, while you're improving your craft, if the money comes, it comes without you re really knowing that it's coming, you know. <laughs> Steals don't, up on you. It steals yeah, yeah. up on you, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Of course, now we have television and all those other things, but don't worry about making any money in the theater. Forget about that. <laughs> that's, just, that's just love and a lot of hard, hard work. And after you've left theater for a while and go into television and movies uh, and come back into the theater, then you will find how hard theater is. That's eight performances a week, and when you do a hard role like I'm doing right now, you'll find how hard and how little the money it is. <laughs> <laughs> what part did you play in Carmen Jones? I saw it, and we all Well, and the original, I, well, well uh, you know, Billy Rose uh, produced yes. Carmen Jones, and that was the black version of Carmen. Now, uh, there was a recent uh, production of Carmen that they seemed to say that was the first. No. The black version of Carmen was called Carmen Jones. It opened at the Broadway Theater. And he auditioned re regionally all over the United States to every major music school and dance school. He wanted the best. And we were a conglomerate of talent all over the United States. Came to New York, auditioned regionally, and got in. Now, I auditioned for the role of, which would be the equivalent to Frasquita and my role was Frankie. Yes. Now when I got here, our audition was going to do it. And as in the theater, we have lots of sadness that comes upon us. I ended up in the chorus, but after we opened on Broadway, uh, about a month after I opened, I understudied the role and I went in as Frosquita. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, as Frankie, and I, mm -hmm. I did that. I didn't open on Broadway as Frosquita, I, I was in the chorus. And in fact, opened in my hometown of Philadelphia mm -hmm. in the pit chorus. We had two choruses, one up on the stage and one in the orchestra. <laughs> in the orchestra. And, um, but uh, uh, it, uh, it just opened a whole new life for me because I started, in the, I, I started not to study theater, I trained to be a concert singer. That was my training in Philadelphia, to, to train for the concert stage. And um, when Billy Rose came, when they sent the talent scouts to Philadelphia, uh, I auditioned. In those days when we auditioned for the musical stage, you had to read uh, notes. You can't, couldn't get up and just sing a song. If you sang your song, then you would hand it a piece of music and you had to read those notes. And then you were put together given an original song to sing and had to read that cold and then after you read that then you were put together with another voice and had to read that for that voice and I was under the tutelage of uh, Robert Shaw who's now the conductor of the uh, Atlanta Symphony so I had very good training and it, I stayed here in New York and I said this is for me opening night at the uh, Broadway theater when that curtain went up I said oh this is for me <laughs> and, I stayed, and I stayed and I'm glad that I stayed we are too <laughs> thank, you. Very exactly thank you thank you <laughs> Did you get to know Oscar Hammerstein? Who oh, wrote one of Carmen? the greatest people, because he wrote the, the libretto for Carmen Jones. And if you, sometimes you're browsing around in the musical library and look at the words, that libretto, and see the wedding of the, the lyrics to the score. They're the most wonderful yeah, lyrics. I can remember um, the Toreador, so. Stand, stand up, up and fight for yes. so you hear the bell. Toe, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Stand <laughs> toe to toe. Yeah, yeah. Really. It was yeah. wonderful. Right. Yeah, really a work of art. By it was, Oscar it Hammerstein. was. And yes. uh, those days, you know, money was, uh, Billy Rose was really an entrepreneur and uh, money, he spent lots of money for his extravaganzas. And each curtain to each scene was a magnificent Spanish shawl mm -hmm. in the color of the scene. And what made it so uh, exciting, I think it was the first time that blacks had been, in those days we called it colored, uh, mm -hmm. used the word colored, and it was all right with me, it didn't make any difference, because blacks in those days, the word black was derogatory. It is no longer derogatory today. But um, uh, the colors were so gorgeous. The first scene, which if you know the story of Carmen, was um, in the, in the original Carmen, it was the tobacco factory. But still, those were the war years uh, when we were doing Carmen Jones. And uh, we had, everything was converted into a parachute factory. And uh, the colors were done up in very lovely yellows and browns. So therefore, your, 
your shawl was, was the color of yellow and brown with fringe that must have been eight feet, <laughs> you know, eight feet long, you know. And then your next scene, which in the, uh, in the opera, which is Lila's Pastor's Cafe, which was, uh, ours was Billy Pastor's Cafe, and they were done up in the, in the magentas, the pearl purples in the magentas. And we, I don't know if you know jazz, we had uh, the great uh, Cozy Cole was the band leader, was the, uh, the drummer, and everything was done up in the spangles. And I find that uh, in the 40 years, the cycle comes around because we're doing spangles now. Everything <laughs> spangles in sequence. Well, that's when that scene came up, that that curtain was that way, and everything was like that. And when we had our great country club scene, we had the velvet trees that were done up in glass glass uh, uh, leaves and velvet leaves, and if you remember yes, all of that. And don't buy a book, design a set. <laughs> that's important. And we had, a, we, had a very, we had a full symphony orchestra in the pit, you know, and uh, and then the last scene, which was, which would have been the Toreador scene, uh, or the bullfight scene, we w it was done up in red, white, and black, and uh, and ours was the big fight, the big uh, the 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 big uh, prize fight scene, which was very exciting. It's when uh, it really was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, terrific. We haven't had anything that exciting in the states since. Joe, you want to tell us about your first part? <laughs> Was it as exciting as that? <clears throat> well, my first professional play was Hair. Oh, well, that <laughs> so was exciting. It was a very revealing part in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I think it was a classic of example of just jumping uh, right into it. <laughs> in the sense that I, at the, previous to that, I was a student at the Goodman Theater in Chicago. And I just finished my second year, and I was about to begin my third year of the three-year program. And then Hare came to town, and Tom O'Horgan held these auditions, and thousands of people went down, marched down to the Schubert Theater. And I remember the first time, the, my first audition, I went, because I had been going to theater school, I, they, they, they teach you the proper way to audition. I remember I showed up looking similar to the way I'm looking now, which is not the way I usually look. So I walked in, and I was carrying uh, the music, I think, to Carnival or something, or Brigadoon, that's what it was. <laughs> I had the music to Brigadoon, and, um, and I stood up and I introduced myself and put the music on the lectern and, and sang, you know, on a clear, I, whatever, I forget what the song was, I think Heather on the Hill or something from Brigadoon. And I remember looking out and seeing Tom O'Horgan and a few of the other casting people like. <laughs> 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 and when I finished, they said, well, uh, you, you have a very nice voice, Mr. Montaigne, but can you come back tomorrow uh, looking a little more funky? <laughs> And I, and I really couldn't understand it, because I had no idea what hair was. I mean, I just knew, oh, it's a, it's a musical, it's Broadway, it's... <laughs> so I remember the next day I had to borrow like a blanket from a friend and something <laughs> like that. And I came in looking a bit more funky, and uh, ultimately I did get the part. But the, but the one thing that, that was memorable for me about it was the, the, the going from a, a school situation to immediately doing a show where you're playing in a... 2500 seat theater and as Theresa had said doing eight shows a week week after week after week after week and it was that really so it was almost like that trial by fire in a way and in a way it's probably the most memorable experience I've had as it was the first and also the most difficult but yes yet also the most fun because it was the type of thing that I think if you endured I ultimately did the show for over a year and a half and uh, I think just getting through it and just that experience and learning by doing uh, was a very valuable thing. Um, it kind of made the rest of it, put, put everything else kind of into perspective in terms of the discipline, the, the, it's one thing to take a voice class in an acting school and you're putting corks in your mouth and looking at mirrors and saying, what, why am I doing this? What's the, what's the value of this? And then it's another thing that you're in your six month of a run and perhaps your voice is getting a little scratchy or this, that, and the other, and, and unless you use those kind of facilities like focusing your voice and doing all the proper things that you have to do to just be able to get on that stage and do your job every night and all of a sudden it all starts to click in and you realize oh that's why I'm that's why you doing do that. Mm -hmm. Sigourney would you like to say something about your first part? By the way I knew your father very very well. <laughs> <laughs> oh tell him you said yeah. hello. Um, say hello. <laughs> well my first part uh, paying part would have been um, in Titanic, which you mentioned mm -hmm. by Christopher Durang, with whom I went to Yale. 
uh, probably the best thing that um, I personally got out of you was that all the all the playwrights and directors who worked with us for three years, and then we all came to New York at the same time, and we knew each other, and we hired each other, so that was good. But um, <laughs> otherwise, you know. <laughs> and in Titanic, I played a, uh, a multiple schizophrenic who kept a hedgehog in her vagina. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> thank you. my greatest role, no, and, and a seagull, and and several other things, but um, it, was a, it was a wonderful um, play, and we did it on a double bill with the first incarnation of Das Usitania Songspiel, and what I remember about it chiefly was that Chris Durang, and, because none of us had any money, was also the prop master, and he also doubled as the captain's wife, and had to be wrapped up as a mummy and wheeled on stage every night, wearing my Chinese sort of frog socks, and... Um, it was, it was, I don't think he'll ever do that again. <laughs> it's, it's very difficult, but it was, um, we lasted two weeks. We had like hundreds of people there for our opening, and then the next night, there were four people there. <laughs> there were four people. It was the most surreal experience, you know? We were so excited, you know? Oh boy, the play's going, and we're gonna, you know? And then the next day, no one was there. Everyone read the reviews and believed them. And I saw Cloud Nine, what, a couple of years ago, and I said, well, this is no stranger than Titanic. Titanic is, you know, certainly on sort of the same level. So I guess it's, it's timing, but I must say, it, it sort of threw us that after all that work, uh, we, we weren't able to go on. Anyway, that was my first job. <laughs> Jeanette, have you uh, something to say about your first, my first job? job? Well, I was employed first by my father, which uh, was a lot of nepotism in my country. Um, my father is a, an actor and... Uh, he, Very famous actor. Well, thank you. And um, he, uh, he'd written an adaptation of Kafka's Trial, which he called The Temptation of Mr. O. And he created the part of a deaf mute child. And I'm sure the reason he did this was because, you know, he'd taken 11 years, I was 11 at the time, taken 11 years, my shouts and screams and sulks, and he thought, I know what I'll do. I'll write this part for deaf mute and I'll give it to Chanel. <laughs> and uh, he, he did, and that was my first professional experience. Uh, it was during the school holidays. And up until that point, I had actually wanted to be a nun. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but this changed my mind. <laughs> uh, th we played that for about three weeks. I wasn't particularly good, but um, it was a very interesting experience for a young girl. And then I joined the Abbey Theatre subsequently, which is the beginning of my professional career, which is the Irish National Theatre. And I remained there for um, <clears throat> two years, and then I was <laughs> thrown out because I couldn't be heard past the first six rows of the stalls. So it was yeah. wonderful of you to <laughs> preface your introduction by saying I could be heard, because I've spent about 12 to 14 years working so hard on that, on, on that particular mm -hmm. um, element you, of my craft. You, you, won, you won it. You won the battle. How, how many Cusacks so. are in the theatre? Is your father, but are there many My others? grandparents too. My, right. my grandparents were strolling players. They ran a fit-up company which toured the provinces of England and Ireland. My dad started acting when he was five. He, um, he used to go to a different school every week. He used to knock on the local school and say, I'm with the actors, can I come to school? And uh, then of our lot, I'm afraid there are three of us girls who are in the acting profession. And my brother is a television director. And my young brother has just gone into theatre management. So that's a clean sweep. Yeah, clean sweep. <laughs> Fantastic. That's perfectly wonderful. Well, what was your first role at the Abbey? Do you remember that? Oh, my first role at the Abbey was that of a dipsomaniac. And at that <laughs> point, I mean, I've made up for it since. But um, at that point, I didn't know much about alcohol. So I had what a, a fellow actor suggested, because I really didn't know the effects of alcohol, and he said to me, Chanel, the best way to do this is get yourself a little bottle of whiskey, and just before you go on stage, sniff it. And I used to stand in the wings sniffing this <laughs> whiskey. That was how I approached the role. In those days, the, the Abbey Theatre was not producing great work. It was very much in a trough. And... Um, <laughs> I joined them just about then and didn't improve matters at all. Uh, 
it, it um, they were producing a lot of sort of kitchen sink drama. Mm -hmm. It's on and the new, up now. New mm. plays. A lot of new plays, a lot of bad plays. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's on it's on the up and up now. And what was your first role with the Royal Shakespeare? My first role. Oh, my first role. But you see, you're talking about all my failures, Jean. I was uh, <laughs> I was asked to um, take over from Judy Dench in a play called London Assurance in 1973 or 74. And Judy Dench is arguably one of the greatest actresses on the English stage. I mean, she's stunning, and as a comedian, she she has no uh, equal. And uh, they asked me to take over. <laughs> And uh, I did, with terrible, <laughs> dire results. <laughs> so I was shoved out of the Royal Shakespeare Company once again. And uh, it took me another five years before they let me in again. Oh. <laughs> and the reason they let me in, I'm sure, was it was a play called Wild Oats. And I had seen it about half a dozen times because Jeremy, my husband, was in it. So I knew it awfully well, and I also knew all the cast. So when the leading lady decided to leave, once again it was a takeover, they, my mates got together, including Jeremy, and said to the director, Clifford Williams, look, Sinead had seen it about a dozen times. I mean, she knows all the words. It'll cut down <laughs> rehearsal time to two days. Um, <laughs> give it to her. And indeed he did. He auditioned me and gave it to me. But by then I had learned a few lessons, and I was better. <laughs> <laughs> so they let me stay. Now you, Frank. <laughs> Well, my first professional part was in a revival of The Immoralist, uh, which was done in uh, off-Broadway at uh, the Bowery Lane Theatre, and it occurred to me while I was thinking about my first part that I'm, and I was paid a minimum salary, and I'm now doing a revival of Arthur Miller's play After the Fall for a minimum <laughs> off-Broadway salary, so you see how far I've gotten <laughs> <laughs> in 20 years. But I remember the Bowery Lane Theatre was a bank, and um, Someone called and said, go down. I was a non-equity actor. Go down and audition for the director. And I did in the morning, way uh, in the bowels of uh, New York. And I saw some glimmer in the director that he liked what I did. And he asked me to come back in the afternoon and read for the writer, who was a woman named Ruth, Ruth Getz. Oh, Ruth Getz. And I went to, I had like four hours. So I went to a bar in the Bowery. And I memorized the scene, because I thought I'd have a better crack at it if I, if I put it to memory, and I did. And I went back and I read for the, the writer, and then uh, they asked me to go home uh, nicely. <laughs> and then they called me the next day and said, would you come back and read with some actresses? And I went back the next day and I started to read the, the character again with each actress as she came in to play the leading lady. And they got to actress number 9 and actress number 10 and 11 <laughs> and 12. And I was getting worse and worse <laughs> and worse because I was thinking, well, in, in this, maybe if they didn't like what I did the first time, I'll, I'll do something else here. So I gave them 14 variations <laughs> of the character. And finally, I don't know where I got the courage, but you have that kind of courage when you're very young. I said, I can't go on uh, reading opposite all of these people because um, You'll just see every pitfall I have as an actor. <laughs> and um, I just don't, I, I think you, you either have to cast me or let me go home. And they both looked at each other and said, I thought you told him that he had the part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, apparently they had, made, they had decided when I'd read for them the day before that I was to be their uh, leading man. And each thought the other was going to call me at home, tell me I had the part, and then come in and work with the leading lady. So I'm, I'm glad I said it or I would have gone on into the night not knowing. <laughs> but that was uh, 1963 or 64, and we were paid uh, $50 a week in cash. You got 47, 47 something after that mm. little brown envelope. Yeah. Yeah. Sigourney, what's it like working with Mike Nichols? <laughs> um, great, great, uh, in a word. He's, uh, I, I don't know what I quite expected because I guess I've always admired Mike Nichols so much. Um, it seemed to me that, you know, I, I just really wanted to work with him. And uh, when we were working on Hurley Burley, which was a very, very difficult play, very dense play. Um, it was like trying to find your way through an impassable wilderness. And he kept saying again and again, this play has no plot. So we must tell the story. And the story is, a, you know, a human story. We must 
put up these huge signposts so the audience can sort of get each chunk and then each chunk will lead to another chunk and actually it was all conceived in terms of helping the audience just follow the story but actually it's when when I listen to the play now um, the signposts are so true I don't know how he was able to sort of elucidate what they were but he just was uncanny in his ability to find what the sort of linchpin of the scene was and it was always there inside you because we worked on it so early but I must say that for such a long time the play was still a wilderness you know we were just sort of going from signpost to signpost and uh, he really is and he would say like the first scene he'd say this is the honeymooners you know this is like she said that about me well you can't say it but anyway you know yeah. hell with her basically and I don't know he just he just saw it so clearly yeah. you know? did, he, did well, you worry in the course of rehearsals of working uh, about the length of the second act it's an exceptionally low of the second act yeah. and that's, that's well, what he hears audience uh, yeah. response in respect to that rather than anything else yeah. it's so full of interest but yet it is hard for the audience to maintain its interest in well the, I think the big thing in rehearsal was there was actually another scene in the first act mm -hmm. um, I won't go into it because a lot of people here probably haven't seen it but there was another scene between two of the main characters a third scene at the end of the first act and I guess most of the discussion there was really no rewriting maybe a couple of scenes but was whether to put this was to even rehearse this scene as part of the play and Mike contends that you don't need it and I'm I'm not sure David Rave agrees with him and I expect that the next time they do Hurley Burley in a full production the whole play will be done which will you know be about <coughs> four and a half hours long um, it's a very hard play to cut it, it felt like we needed we, we first of all had like six weeks of rehearsal and then the Chicago tryout we needed at least that much time in order to know in order to first of all make the play play fast enough so that we could squeeze by without cutting because I think Rabe really didn't want to cut and uh, so Mike just kept saying pace pace you know go 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 faster don't break up the lines the whole thought you know because each speech is like this long yeah. so if you if you start doing things with it you know <laughs> out, but um, it was an extremely difficult play for to act. I yeah. would think oh, one of the hardest I ever saw. I think. Mm. Yeah, such a pleasure though, because it's so brilliantly written. I mean, it was impossible to read. It took me three tries to read it, which has never happened to me. I mean, I usually read a play all the way through. Three tries, I'm going. <laughs> you know, <it's> like, oh. <laughs> I really. What did you What did you all have to uh, call on to bring forth what Mike Nichols was asking you to do? Because it's an unorthodox kind of directing, yeah. it seems to me, as you just describe yeah. it. He gave you a lot of freedom. Um, it, it was, it, you know, each of us in this play is from a different training and a different background. Mm -hmm. You know, we had Chris Walken, who works his own way, and Bill Hurt, who was Juilliard trained. I went to Yale. Judy Ivey went to Goodman. Um, Cynthia Nixon never went anywhere because she <laughs> started so early. But, um, and Jerry Stiller, uh, it, he, he, so he, he basically would listen to you a lot, um, and I think approached each role differently. I'm amazed at how he cast the play. I mean, Jerry Stiller plays what could be a sort of crass person, but he has so much humanity that he invests in this man that you, he's, he's sort of, but you still love him. And I'm amazed at, at you know, the fact that he, he chose all these very different and, and potentially, potentially not an ensemble. And through, I mean, when I left the show about 10 days ago, and I must say they had a birthday party for me right at the end, and I looked around the room and I thought, we are an ensemble. In spite of ourselves, we have become so. an ensemble and <laughs> such a family. And it's, I'll just say one quick story, because what Joe mentioned about the theater reminded me of it. I once saw a play called Faith Healer by Brian Friel. Is that how you pronounce yeah. the name? And it was with James Mason. It got terrible reviews. And I thought, well, we got to see this, you know, because it sounds really interesting. We went to see the last performance. And, at the, and it was riveting. I mean, it was so good. It was um, three acts, all monologues, Clarissa Kay, Donald Donnelly, and James Mason, each of them by themselves. And it was about this faith healer who can't call up this power all the time. It was a riveting show. 
And then at the end, I had just finished Alien, which was my first movie, and it was very, it was a discouraging process for me because they always took sort of the first take, and oh, it just drove me crazy four months of that. I, I came back sort of feeling, oh, the theater, the theater, heal me. And I went to see this play, and at the end of the performance, we were all clapping at the curtain call, and James Mason put up his hand and he said, you know, in the annals of Broadway, this play will go down as a failure, but for us, it has been an unqualified success, and they embraced, yes. and I felt so healed. And I remember thinking, oh, thank God I come from the theater, you know. It's just the kind of thing you were talking about, and it was such a moving thing, you know, for people to see that. How know, fortunate that to be able stage. to have had that experience. Yeah. We're going to have to take a short break now. And during that time, would you please gather any questions that you might have and give to the volunteers so that they can be answered. Make them as short as possible so as many people as possible can answer. Don't get up yet, but when you do, stay in your places or come right back because it's a very short time indeed. And then we will go on with what it is to work in the theater. We're continuing with the American Theatre Wing seminars on working in the theatre. These seminars are coming to you from the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. It is one of the programs of the American Theatre Wing, which is a year-round organization devoted to serving the community through the theatre. Our two board members, Jean Dalrymple, Brendan Gill, act as co-moderators, and I am Isabel Stevenson, and I'm president of the American Theatre Wing. And I don't want to take any time off from these wonderful performers who are talking about what it is to work in the theatre. So, Jean, will you continue as we were going before we were interrupted? Uh, Frank, as I said a few minutes ago, I'd love to know about your training before you went into your first play. Um, I went to Syracuse University and I studied uh, there for three years with a gentleman who's now deceased uh, named Sawyer Falk, who's a wonderful, marvelous man of the theater. I remember the, the thing he used to say to me all the time was, act in spite of your neuroses, not because of them. <laughs> <laughs> and he's half right. <laughs> and, um, and then I came, when I, I came directly to New York City, it was the early 60s, and I went to, I don't believe in acting classes or, or, or acting schools much, and I went to um, an acting teacher in New York for about six or seven months, and I think I learned rather young that the only way to learn about acting is to get in front of audiences constantly, all the time, as often as you can. Live theater is the best way to, uh, to learn about how to be an actor. And uh, that was basic. My training really has been in front of audiences in New York and in regional theaters for the mm -hmm. last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And did you have any uh, well, background of that kind? It's interesting what Frank says. I, I had uh, no acting school training at all. I went to university to read English and then joined the Abbey Theatre while I was still at university. It's a rather schizophrenic existence. But <laughs> I, at that time, the Abbey Theatre was not a teaching theatre. Uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company, on the other hand, is a teaching theatre. <clears throat> so we had no lessons on the side um, for voice or movement or anything. And I actually believe that I wasn't able to realise my ambitions as an actress, which was to play on the classic, play the classics on the stage, um, because I didn't have an instrument that was primed. Um, I had some small talent but unfortunately I wasn't able to project it at all because my body let me down and my voice let me down. And I think because of that lack, I worked terribly hard in my 20s and early 30s to right that wrong. Um, so I kept on working, <clears throat> but it was a very hard thing to pick up. I was way behind my peers as far as um, being able to project myself and my ideas out there, which is the point of acting at all. Um, so I'm not sure that I agree now, yeah. although that's what I began in the same way as well, yourself. Well, I think it's because, you, I think they're for two different reasons. I think that if you go to a place to learn how to move or how to walk or how to speak correctly, that's training you in your technique. And the only way you really can discover how to communicate whatever it is a character yeah. is feeling is through feeling. And somehow, 
the moment you walk out on stage, it seems to me you throw your technique away. You don't think about technique, you think about communicating feeling and emotion. And when you get in front of audiences night after night after night, that test is so extraordinary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As opposed to a classroom where you can, in fact, be very indulgent with yourself and you can take a great deal of time and investigate. But something about the pressure of having to communicate something to an audience, I find I learn from it. Mm -hmm. I always learn in the first preview in front of an audience more than I have learned in all of the rehearsal time. They yeah. tell me yes. so yeah. fast whether a scene is working or right. not. Right, right, absolutely. On Broadway, you had, I, I think there must have been the most electrifying entrance uh, that I can ever remember seeing in the theater in Seascape when suddenly you appeared mm -hmm. over that dude <laughs> and you were, uh, you appeared so fast, you know, this is like a bolt of lightning, suddenly this apparition, this inconceivable thing was there and it was you and moved and it didn't seem possible that you were a human being. It was just, it was perfectly wonderful. You know, it's very strange, we were talking, Sigourney and I were talking in the break about that play. It was a play by Edward Albee called Seascape. And uh, it's something to do, I think, with uh, the choices one should make as an actor, I think. Um, I had not been on Broadway. That was my Broadway debut. And when Edward sent me that script, I read it. And when I got to the entrance of my character, it said, a lizard appears over a rock. <laughs> and Edward had sent me a note saying, I think you're perfect for this part. <laughs> and I was deeply hurt. And, um, but about 10 pages into the play, even before my character had come on, I knew that this was a play I felt I, I had to be in. And um, it was, in fact, a lizard. But the point of, the, of the, the remembrance for me is that almost everyone I know advised me against it as a Broadway debut because I was, in fact, disguised. I had an eight-foot tail, and I, had, I walked around in my hands, and I had big rings. I mean, totally disguised. You couldn't, it didn't matter who it was. <laughs> and everybody said, don't do this play. I mean, it's not the way to make your Broadway debut. Yeah. And I did it because I loved the part. And it turned out to be personally very successful for me. And the same was also true of Dracula. Everyone said, don't go near it. It's silly. It's old fashioned. It's this and that. So you really should follow that thing inside yourself, which tells you, I must play this part, regardless of whether it runs an hour, a week, a month, <laughs> or a year. I must play this part. And somehow it all evens out, and your career goes along the way you want it to because you've made your choices as a result of something that's burning inside you, not as a result of something that seems like a right career move or the right timing or because, like, a man once offered me a play about Lincoln because it was a political year. And I said, do you want to see a play about Lincoln again? Another play about Lincoln? He thought that it would go because it was a political year. It has yeah. nothing to do for an actor, I think. You shouldn't think of those things. You should just think of what the part means to you. Yeah. Well, now, as far as training goes, uh, in your case, uh, Sigurdin, you got used to taking big chances with yourself, and you were so bold and everything, especially in that song spiel thing with Christopher, I thought was wonderful. But it was your, wasn't it your training at Yale that made you at ease with yourself that way so that you could take <coughs> these big chances or not? I was not one of the uh, white sheep at Yale. I was a black sheep at Yale. Yeah. There were lots of us. I was, certainly wasn't singled out. But I would say that if you can go to a school and get lots of parts, it's great. But if you're at a school and politically you're not getting parts, I, I actually transferred into the playwriting program at Yale because I was cast as either prostitutes or old women again and again. I thought yeah. I'm going to get out of this school not knowing how to play a part that I might conceivably be cast for in the real world. The thing that saved me was that my playwright friends wrote these insane things that really people didn't know what to do with, and we did them in the cabaret, and we did... That's where I experienced sort of my breakthroughs and began... I had a lot of confidence when I got to Yale. I'd done a lot of college theater, and, but by the time I left Yale, I must say I didn't have a lot of confidence, and I also had somehow lost touch with my love of the theater because it was very serious at Yale and there were things you, you know, Shakespeare was like up here and you didn't do Williams and you didn't do Miller and it was a very, I don't know, sort of rigid philosophy I found and uh, it How wasn't like... How could you and Christopher have a Well, I think that. actually it was, it was almost in, in defense of that that yeah. we exploded <laughs> once we got to New York. We, we um, you know, we just started having such a good time. Yeah. And uh, I think that, that you see, you know, just the, 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 uh, to be able to audition for a role, which we were never allowed to do at the Yale Drama School, you know, to, to just look at backstage and even though you had to wait a long time to actually be seen, 
it was it was suddenly a democracy, you know, it was freedom. And so I think if I'd perhaps been given a lot of encouragement at Yale, New York would have been hard. I would have had expectations as it was. I was ready to become a bank teller the next day. <laughs> I had nothing to lose. Yeah. And, um, you know, so I, that was, uh, that was my... I have one question which I want to ask before anybody in the audience uh, prevents me from asking it. If I don't ask it now, I may go to my grave not knowing the answer. I come from Hartford, Connecticut. Ah. Famous in Hartford, Connecticut in the 19th century was a poet, Lydia Sigourney. She was known as the sweet singer of Hartford. A very poor poet indeed, but the sweet singer of Hartford. But in Hartford we pronounce the name Sigourney and you pronounce it Sigourney. Now how does that happen? Well, it's, uh, Sigourney Street in Hartford is actually now a red light district. <laughs> and it, in high school, lots of boys would say, I'm going to steal the sign of your name and send it to you, but no one ever did. But um, I chose my name out of a book when I was 14, and not knowing any better, I always pronounced it Sigourney because it was sort of more, uh, Sigourney had a kind of sort of very brisk feeling to yeah. it that I didn't really relate to. So yeah. it's just you know, probably a mistake, you know. I mean, <laughs> I'm always telling people how to pronounce their yes, names. Yes, right. Especially the Irish, because the Irish pronounce yes. Donovan Donovan now. I say, don't you know how to pronounce your own name? <laughs> and then, what well, oh, yeah. after, after hair, where you learned something about your fate and uh, something presumably also about your body, what was the next role after that? Oh, well, immediately after that, I did Godspell, which was another yeah. long hair <laughs> musical. <laughs> I think I was getting typecast. I mean, I, I literally had my hair long for about 11 years in my life, I mean, just because I was doing these different things. But well, I did Godspell right after that. And then, um, then I think I did something that was very valuable for me, and it's in, somewhat in keeping with what Frank had mentioned. I, I joined an acting company in Chicago called the Organic Theater Company, which, uh, for good or bad, what was good about it was here was a group of actors who were uh, creating their own work. So for five years, I was with them, and um, the best thing about it is that there was never that period of time when you were, had to worry about auditioning or, you know, where is this next job going to come from. So those five years with that company was a very valuable um, thing. We, we, we were able to tour Europe twice, so we got to travel. Um, and in terms of becoming an ensemble, here were people who had constantly working together as a group. And um, it, it was a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. And I, I probably learned as much, you know, from that experience as I, in some aspects, as I learned at a place like Goodman. Though it is different, because I think Sinead and um, Frank are correct in that, I mean, they're both right, in other words, that there are things that you really can't learn in a school, that you, you, you have to just be up there and do it. But yet then again, as Frank says, you forget the technique when you're on that stage, but just like... I mean, he's just like a baseball player. I mean, George Brett, when he gets up to the bat, I don't think he thinks of all the times he had to study, you know, yeah. in batting practice of how to hit that ball. It just comes naturally. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, the instinct takes over. Uh, but the reason that instinct is there is because there was a lot of preparation that went on before. You I've had a musical uh, preparation, didn't you? But yes. that was a great help, wasn't it? It was a great <coughs> help, but then I decided that I wanted to... Um, uh, to do plays, and when I, were, I went to, uh, to read for a play, they would say, oh, marvelous, but what is your background in the theater? And I said, well, I did this musical, I did that musical, but what plays have you done? And I had no background in plays, and I never got the part. <laughs> so then I had to, I said, well, I'm going to get a part in the play. So then I turned down musicals. And I kept going, reading and reading and reading. So my first play was Our Land by Theodore Ward, which was done at the Henry Street uh, Playhouse here in New York, mm -hmm. and was finally brought to the Royal Theater under the direction of Eddie Dowling. And during those days, most plays that are, were done on Broadway uh, were done by the Theater Guild, uh, and were plays about the Reconstruction days. And I got my first, I did a curtain raiser, and I was Aunt Patsy. I always played older roles. Uh, uh, <laughs> I was about 80 years old. And I was <laughs> thrilled to death to be able to do, a, just, just do lines. And I fell in love with it. Of course, in, in uh, having a musical background, a lot of people say, well, how could a black person stay in the theater so long? I put it all together because I could sing. 
I did background music. I could do a concert. I could do many things to put it all together. That's how I stayed in the theater so long. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and how you got your technique. That's right. You worked on That's I time. worked on it because mm -hmm. I learned languages. I learned roles. And, you, uh, and I had marvelous teachers. Uh, I studied opera. I studied the concert stage. And when you learn to sing uh, art songs, you're painting portraits. And if you can get that poetry together and be able to transmit it across to the audience, then you have done your work. And it's the same thing. Yes. Did you audition for Ma Rainey? Not really. I was up at Yale doing another play called The Day of the Picnic with James Earl Jones, which I thought was coming to Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> and the last day of my performance up there, which was a matinee, um, Lord Richards came to my dressing room. He says, what is this I hear about that you uh, have something to do? I said, yes. I said, I, said, I can't wait on the theater. To, to hire me. I said, I have my own one-woman show that I do, and I said, I'm booked to do something the day that Ma Rainey is going to open up here. I said, are you interested in me? And he said, yes. I said, well, I've been up here 10 weeks. I said, why hasn't somebody said something to me? <laughs> so he said, I'm really interested, Teresa. And it seems that the author of, of Ma Rainey had seen me do the role of Denise in the day of the picnic. And he said, that's Ma Rainey. <laughs> so I said, well, I'll go home and see what I can do to get out of this other thing. I hadn't signed the contract. That's the only thing that got me out of it. And I'm very happy that it did. So that you didn't have to audition. They saw you and they yeah. said, well, well I had to come in and see them and talk uh -huh. to them one of those days. Only thing that I might not have done, Ma Rainey, for the simple reason that I had never done a role which I used profanity. I'd always been a sweet, sweet, sweet mama type. <laughs> And I'm known as that's my mama from television, the sweet loving lady. Maybe I had read that, read that script, I might not have taken it. Also, <laughs> I not, I'm not known as a blues singer. And I have been turned down uh, as a blues singer. They said, oh no, you can't sing blues, blues. I said, oh. I had wanted to replace someone in Ain't Mr. Hill. Oh, well, she can't sing blues. I wanted to do that sort of raucous role in the, uh, what is it, the Best Little Whorehouse. They said, well, she can't sing that. Well, I did do the movie, so what can I say? <laughs> so, uh, I'm just saying. And uh, when I was called in, I said, well, I don't know any blues song. So, uh, what is that? I did, I did sing Careless Love. I made something up. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm here. <laughs> I wanted to touch you. <laughs> Lightly on, on auditions, how, how you handle auditions, if we can, just briefly before we get questions. Yes, well, did you were, audition? Yes, but just, just what, what were you doing when you, uh, when did the good guy go on? It was funny, I was in California and I, would, I had just completed an episode of a short lived TV program called Mr. Smith that starred a 165 pound orangutan. <laughs> <laughs> And I had spent the whole week with this orangutan walking around the lot at, uh, at Paramount get, so it would be familiar with me because they're very powerful animals. And they told me, they said, oh, they said, don't worry, he's never hurt anybody, though he is ten times stronger than a human being and can rip your arms right out of their sockets. <laughs> so I spent a week walking around the lot at Paramount thinking, I don't think my career is going in the direction <laughs> that I thought it would. So I, I, it, it was really a very kind of a strange and depressing week, and his dressing room was much bigger than mine. <laughs> and I remember I got home, it, it was a few days afterwards, and I was really thinking, uh, you know, I, I just, I don't know, maybe it's time to drive up to the mountains for a couple days and just reevaluate my life. And, <laughs> and I got a phone call from, uh, from uh, Gregory Moser from The Goodman and from David Mamet just saying, hey, how'd you like to do this play? So it's just an example of, but of course, my... my uh, association with them had gone back many years. But it is another example of how in this business we are really all just one phone call or one audition or one moment away from something that can ultimately uh, change your life, be it for better or for worse or whatever. And that's part of the excitement of, of why we are in this business and that's as Teresa had said. It's, as, a, as, a, as a director friend once told me, ultimately we're in this business for the yucks, not for the bucks. <laughs> as long as you keep that in mind, you'll be all right. 
You didn't answer my question. Did you audition? Did so you no, physically? no, I, I did not physically audition. Um, and in other words, what they told me on the phone is it was kind of a funny thing. They says, Joe, uh, you know, we know your work. We know you. We we just haven't decided if we're going to do this show with stars or not. So literally, what they told me is they said, there's three people who are going to do this role. Uh, Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, or you. <laughs> <laughs> so, once they made the decision they weren't going to go with people of that note, then they made the call and says, well, we decided to go the other direction. And uh, that's how I got there. Yeah, they went with the yucks yeah. instead of the bus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What happened in respect you know, to auditions for you nowadays? You, you just choose your play? Yeah, yeah. What happened with After the Fall? I bought you, the rights to it. You won that. <laughs> it's just one way of getting around having That's to right. audition. I'm that, not a good auditioner. Most, yeah. um, almost, I would say every major role I've had in my career I did not audition for. I was offered as a result of something someone had seen me in. I'm not a good auditioner. I, I was better when I was younger. Now it, it would, I wouldn't mind auditioning if someone demanded it, I suppose. <laughs> but um, I think that I did learn things from the early auditions and that um, I think I could pass on about auditions because lots of young actors ask me about auditions. And I think that uh, young actors tend to make a mistake in auditions. They try to suss out what they think the director wants or what they think uh, is, might be right for the character or right for the director's mind. And I think when you audition, you should do what your gut instinct tells you. And if you lose it, you still lose it based on what you would do with the part by instinct. If you try to fake yourself through and then you get the part against whatever it is you truly believe the character is, you're in a lot of trouble in rehearsal. Yeah. Be honest from the very first moment yeah. and do it the way you believe in it and don't do it the way you think uh, someone might in their head think you should be in that role. Yeah. There's no other way to do it, unfortunately. I mean, it really is a terrible process. It's a very painful one and no matter how you're always auditioning anyway. You audition every night when you go out on stage in front of 300 or 600 people. Again, an actor never stops auditioning. But the particular thing of leaving your apartment and getting into a taxi cab and going to an empty stage and getting up on that stage in front of people who are out there in the dark is terrifying for any actor. It doesn't matter whether it's his first or his 90th. There's a wonderful story about that. When I was doing Design for a Living, George Scott, I think, told me, about a woman who auditioned all of her life for Noel Coward and never got a part. She just oh. would audition, always came in a little pillbox hat and a purse and a two-piece suit and she would do her little song and this and that and Coward never cast her. And uh, finally, after 25 years of this, <laughs> there was a non-speaking role in the play and on she came again for the audition and Noel said to the stage manager, well, you know, she's been auditioning for me for 25 years. We could offer her this part and she, it wouldn't be too difficult. She's not a very good actress. So they went down thinking that she'd be delighted and they said, we'd love you to be in the play. And she said, oh, I don't want to be in it. I just like to audition. <laughs> 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 And I do know actors who do like to audition. I don't. I think they're crazy, but I do know actors who in, who enjoy that. I don't enjoy it at all. But you know, I, I I have come to this conclusion that you we are human beings, and when you go to audition, you must go out there like you are a human being. You must not be intimidated by the people who are auditioning you, and you must make them make them treat you as a human being. I agree. Because there's sometimes people who audition you make you feel very bad. Yeah. And if you go out there and know who you are, go out there and audition. Don't ever be intimidated by them. So yeah. therefore that you must know who you are, know your material, and go out there and do it. Now if you don't get it, that's all right. So at least feel good within yourself. But I did the best that I could do. And that's all. That's all you can do. And then if you've lost it, you've lost it honestly. That's what I mean. And That's what it's all about. And also, about. You, you also, I think an actor tends to intimidate himself That's a right. lot. Mm -hmm. And he even may go out there not necessarily feeling intimidated by them, but because he's on trial again, because mm -hmm. he's, and because what we do is so ephemeral, it's in the air. You know, at 11.10, hundreds of people are applauding you, and 11.15, you're in your dressing room, and you're alone, and you go home, and the next night you start all over again. So for an actor, it's a constant reappraisal of himself and an audition for many actors seems to be the center of his insecurity it seems to be the thing that we all went into acting for which is love me want me take me 
make, you know, come in and embrace me. And the audition represents in an actor's mind, I think, the initial insecurity, and it never goes away. And you're quite right, you have to overcome it. Well, do, I is, do we have auditions in, uh, in England, the same as here, oh, or not yes. quite the same? Um, I don't think... Um, a lot of work, because we're smaller, there's less of us, a lot of um, a work arises out of work already done. Um, and in a company like the Royal Shakespeare Company, obviously, once you've done your initial audition, which is terrifying, because you don't have just one director, you have five directors, yeah. because it's a director. It's just, and uh, once you've done your own initial audition, then the parts that come up subsequently are through mutual consent with your, you know, the directors involved. When I, when Much Ado About Nothing was being, um, was being mooted by uh, Terry Hands, I, I went to him with my heart in my mouth and I said, uh, Terry, I'd love to play Beatrice. Um, is there any possibility that I could? He said, don't be silly, Chanel, you have no wit. <laughs> <laughs> You said, nevertheless. I, I said, nevertheless. <laughs> and I fought my corner hard for many weeks, and uh, I won. <laughs> and here you are. And here <laughs> I'm playing Beatrice. <laughs> but I haven't been back on the audition circuit now for five, six years. So it's with great trepidation that I face all that. Now, when he said that, which is essentially a cruel thing to mm. say, did he mean it as cruel, or were you all I friends? think it. I think... No, he, he didn't say it with any... Uh, I don't think he intended cruelty, but he, he meant me to look at myself as an actress, reappraise what I had to give to the character of Beatrice. And indeed, he was right. I had no experience in that area of high wit. And um, he wanted to make certain that I had it in me, that I had the possibility, that I understood the nature of wit. So we used to have long, endless interrogations of, do you understand what wit is? <laughs> you know, uh, so uh, I felt like a school child all over again. Sure. Okay, you, there you were sobbing, the tears streaming. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I understand. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's so hard. Mm -hmm. Very few people could, could, Before could we take. Before we go on to questions, could we just have one quick statement from you? Because John Shea said that at Yale, he was taught so very much that when he finally came out and, and established himself, as you recall, he said that he auditioned directors. <laughs> yeah. And someone on the panel asked if he would ever reject it. And he said, yes, you quite do. frequently. You, 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 how do you feel about yeah, that? I think it's a good opportunity to, to find out how the other person works. I like auditioning. In the, in the old days, it was like, for five minutes a week, you get to play a part. I didn't care if I got it or not. I just wanted to work for five minutes. Mm -hmm. It was like, it was, to me, such a great thing to get an audition. Uh, and I still believe that. Um, for, uh, I think you always get to, uh, especially with film directors, I find I want to read with them because I can see if they know what they're doing or if they're just sort of, you know, um, <laughs> it, it shows me how they're going to deal with me. Are they, do they want to hear my questions or are they sort of going, oh, yeah, you know, you know another <laughs> broad asking questions. Sort of and very often they don't know. The director has yeah. no idea. He's waiting for the actor to give him right. some, yes. uh, right. some signal. We're about to open the seminars to questions and would you please be as brief as possible and direct your question to whoever, whichever one of the panelists that you'd like to answer. Okay, well actually this question is for everyone or anyone because any one of you can answer this and this is, I think all of us might want to know this. When you were first starting out and you get to those points where you're just ready to quit, ready to throw it all away, what kept you going? What kept you to push on? The knowledge that I couldn't do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Thank you. Hi, my question is for Chanel. Um, I'm going to England to study in January. Do you think there's any merit for an American to study in England? I mean, is the, the technique, the concept so different? No, I, I think there is value in going to any country in the world to study its theatre. Um, I think England has certain things to offer which might not be available to you here. Um, I think uh, that probably you will see um, more classics in England than you might have the opportunity of seeing here in New York. Um, um, but I mean, I, I have just completed a, a tour of Europe and I learned more about theatre. I, I made it my business to go and see a play in each of those countries, not understanding the language at all, mm. but I made it my business to go and see actors working in Berlin, in East Berlin and in Prague and in Barcelona. 
and it's just always uh, valuable. It's terrifically valuable. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference in the technique? Well, you said you really did study, per se. Well, yes, in, um, because I knew, my, I knew my problems, so I honed in on the best person to treat my problems. We have a woman in England who, to my mind, is the greatest voice teacher in the world, bar none. Um, and that's a fairly uh, broad <laughs> statement, but a lady called Cicely Berry. Mm. Um, and she is a superb voice teacher who I went to. She's attached to the RSC, but she also does a lot of work outside. Um, she was terrifically useful. I think probably w the advantage we have possibly is that we have a resident playwright called William Shakespeare. He is <laughs> our resident playwright. So our, our attention to text and our exploration of text in there at, uh, of Shakespeare's text um, is it, it's very informed because we have a lot of people who have worked on those texts for a long time and so the work that is being done there I hope is, is very good work of a high standard. We have a couple hundred years to catch up on this. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Hi. Hi, my question is for Frank. Um, what are the steps which you take in preparing for a role? Like as far as observation or substitution or anything along those lines? Um, it varies with the part. First, I would just like to say one thing about the first question. I think the thing that can keep you going during the bad times is, and I don't mean this facetiously, I mean it very, very sincerely, you must always believe that everybody else is wrong. <laughs> yes. You must truly, truly believe during the worst times of your career when no one is hiring you or no one wants you that they're all wrong. <laughs> and if you don't keep that going in yourself, then you won't survive in the profession because even sometimes when they're right, it doesn't matter. You must believe that they're wrong and you must continue to believe in yourself. It's a very simple thing to say, but it really is all that will sustain you. Not money, not fame not reviews, nothing but that inner thing. Um, I, uh, the process of preparing for a part has changed. When I was uh, much younger, I found that I did a great deal more preparation than I do now, and a great deal more standing in the wings and getting it all going and getting myself energized to go on. And now I try very hard to get to the theater at the last second, and I, don't, I talk with the other actors up until a, maybe a minute before I go on stage, because I find that the living out there and the adrenaline that happens to me when I walk on a stage immediately, fresh, without any sense of inner preparation is much better for me, that I, I live it moment to moment with the audience as opposed to standing in the wings and storing it up. In terms of rehearsal, that's changed for me too now. I really don't believe much in, in uh, uh, getting steep in the background of a character or finding out too much about him historically because it tends to dwarf my imagination about him. In my imagination, my character can do anything he wants. Once I've figured him out, he's, he's free to do anything. And if I have any kind of facts to limit that, it, it stops me. I think now I do less and less at home and more and more on my feet, more and more in the rehearsal. I try not to come to the rehearsal with a plan for the day. I just start working and I look at the other actor and she looks at me and it begins to happen. And very often you'll discover Extraordinary accidents will give you a character, a prop, or um, the way another actor acts to you that day, or something falling over, or some decision that you just don't know what to do with the scene, so you'll just wing it, and something will happen inside. If you stay open to the rehearsal process, and if you stay open while you're performing, that ends up being how you find a character. The, the idea that you must find your character, know what he is, know what he wants, before you set foot in front of an audience is crazy. It all just keeps changing, and if you're in a long run, if you could videotape your performance from the first preview and look at it two weeks later and then three months later, you'd be amazed at the variances and the changes. Does Do you that find, answer your question? Yeah, just one more thing. Do you find that a lot of the technique work and a lot of it seeps through, through the spontaneity of just, just doing it and working moment by moment? Yes, I think that... Um, I think there's too much emphasis on technique in all forms of life these days. There are too many books about being technical on too many things, especially in acting. It's about feeling. And as we said earlier, if you have confidence in your technique, if you have done whatever work you think you need to do with yourself technically, then you must fly emotionally. What happens is if you have a, a good inner sense of your own technique, it does free, free you emotionally, because when you walk out on stage, you're not thinking about, does my voice sound well? Am I making that turn? Is my thigh out if it's restoration comedy? You automatically know 
or if it's anything, <laughs> if it, you automatically know that you have those tools, and then you're right. quite free to fly emotionally. And that's really what the, the being on a stage is about. It's making people feel, really. And no matter how you, it's legitimate no matter how you do it. If you do it emotionally, it's legitimate. If you do it technically, it's legitimate. As long as they are moved, it doesn't matter what's going on inside you. Thank you very much. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. This is for Sigourney. Um, do you feel your approach to a part and the rehearsal process has changed a great deal from when you were in grad school, Stanford, um, through off-Broadway, Broadway? Oh, I hope I mean, so. In what, in what ways? In what ways has it changed? Um, I, I, it's very interesting what, what Frank said about the more, the more experience you can get, the less you do. I don't know if the technique sort of builds up, but I do think that the audience teaches you what the play is about, what the scene is about and basically what your job is within that story. Um, I, w I would say every role has its own strange approach. It's like a little path and you, you know, how to prepare for a role. Each role teaches you how to prepare for it in a strange way. Some of them maybe, I, I always thought preparation, I think Estelle Parsons said this, she said, I prepare to give me confidence to go and fly. You know, so if you're gonna work on a film role, I mean, you, you might get to do one scene every two weeks, so you can spend some time just sort of doing some historical research or something like that, just to make yourself feel like you're doing something, and I think it all pays off. But I, I agree with, with Frank that the, if I get too analytical, if I get too much in my head because my background is, uh, my, my education was so intellectual, I don't think it's good for me. It's much better for me to just sort of um, follow strange instincts. It's, it's a much better process for me. So I try not to prepare, too. What kind of preparation did you, did you do for your uh, grad school audition for Yale? Oh, God. Well, I was, gonna, I, was gonna, I was gonna try to teach English, so I sort of went off to this audition, you know, wearing these, oh, this, I mean, my wood clothes, my <laughs> woods clothes, and I did, I did St. Joan of the Stockyard, and um, what else did I do? some other strange play and uh, we all auditioned together in this sort of strange group and we all got to watch each other which was quite exciting um, you know every few years the regime tr changes I would say do what turns you on okay. don't you know don't try to rustle something up necessarily for the next day do something you you know really cold and just have fun with it and just and then that's what they'll respond to is you you know okay thank you very much thank you. hi my name my name is Michelle Hurst. My question is for Shaned. Do you find um, that American audiences are different from your audiences at home? Well, the, the wonderful thing about uh, the wonderful difference between uh, American audience and um, English <coughs> is that uh, the Americans are extraordinarily vociferous when they like what you're doing. The English are not. Um, also, the English are bloody blasé about their, their, their great playwrights and about their theatre. And, uh, and so they tend to, they have so many preconceptions about plays that are theirs, so to speak, Shakespeare, um, that these preconceptions get in the way of their enjoyment. And they remember back to so and so and so and so and so and so. And, so. <clears throat> and they are not fresh and instinctive about their reactions to the audiences here have been extraordinary. And also the generosity of their comment on you, be it good or bad, um, it's it's tangible. Um, in England, sometimes you cannot tell what's what's happening out there, because they sit in their serried ranks and <laughs> judge you. <laughs> Whereas it seems here that there, there actually is, uh, they allow themselves to be, to tell you what they think. It's, it's quite extraordinary. I was just very interested in something Sigourney said earlier about audiences teaching you. And Frank said, I, I played Beatrice for, for two years in England, in Stratford and in London, in a repertory system, in a repertoire system, but for two years. And I never got a right. I knew I hadn't got a right. Um, not that there, there is a final moment where you know with a character you've got, but I was unhappy with my work within the piece. I went out to Europe and suddenly I knew what Beatrice's role was within the shape of the play because Europe taught me. Because in England, because they know their Shakespeare so well and they know a play like Much Ado About Nothing backwards, um, that 
they came with expectation of certain things, certain moments of business, certain moments of pleasure that they remembered. And so they were geared towards that sort of comedy. Went out to Europe where primarily what they wanted to know was what the story was about. And suddenly to have an audience saying, tell us the story. I had to completely reappraise what I was doing and it was one of the healthiest processes that ever happened to me as an actress. Um, because I wasn't playing from business to business or moment of comedy to moment of comedy. I was actually playing the character in the play to people who wanted to hear the story. It was a great, great experience. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Sigourney. Having the opportunity of being in a play and a movie, which do you think is better acting-wise and which do you recommend for people getting into acting? <laughs> well, uh, I would recommend always the stage. I don't know how people do a movie without some kind of experience on stage. You don't get any rehearsal. They take the second take if it's at all good. It's, I think that actors need to have a way of working and that if you have a way of working, the director and the people you're working with will sense it and respect it and work much more your way. If you don't have that coming in, I think you're at their mercy. Um, what I've learned from film that's helped me on stage is how much less I have to do. If I'm really thinking something, I think the audience can get it. I don't need to act it out for them, you know. I think I used to work really hard, you know. <laughs> so the person in the back row would really get it, you know. The person on the front row is like, ugh. Oh. <laughs> so I think it's taught me to trust that connection with the other actor. And if, if I am, in fact, telling the story, and if I'm getting my point across, I don't need to illustrate it a million different ways. Okay, thank you. Hi. Is there a point for any of you, this question, okay. Is there a point when you would say the director should disappear and um, give you the space to develop the part on your own? Oh, yes. <laughs> when do, when well, do you think this should happen? When? Yeah. Well, certainly by the time it's in performance. He, uh, <laughs> <laughs> very often it's the first reading. <laughs> you, uh, you mean where he should just let you go? I yeah. think the best directors are the ones who know that from the very first day, that it really belongs to the actor and it is, it is his job to create it and he is there almost like a, a you know, just a guide and uh, the best directors I've ever worked with are the ones who said the late, least really and just allowed it to happen and allowed it to form in, in a rehearsal process and they watch the previews and begin to help you sculpt it and take away too much of this and too little of that and sort of bring you along. Any director who wants to lay on a concept over a group of people is just mm -hmm. sort of fortifying his own ego. And also there's one thing that both women said that I'd love to comment on about acting on stage and, and, um, and it relates to the director too. One of the hardest things I think one has to learn as an actor is not to recreate is not to do the thing you did last night, but to create every single night. And it's even more difficult on film because you have to keep doing things the same in order to match lights and this and that. But to approach your work, every performance and every rehearsal as if you have never done it before and not to fall in love with anything you do because once you've done it, it's gone. And if you've done it in a, in a take, it's in the can and the director wants it, he'll take it. But if you do it the next time, don't try to redo it again. And on stage, that's what can be terribly freeing as a stage actor, is every night you go out and you think, I've never done this before. And yes, I may have gotten a huge laugh because I did this last night, but tonight I'll approach it this way. Maybe I won't get the laugh, but I'll find something new. This idea of recreating is very dangerous, I think, and just creating fresh is right? very exciting. It's harder to do in front of a camera. One more. I have a question for uh, John Mantegna, please. Um, can you tell me what you think is the main difference between working in an ensemble production as, as opposed to a star vehicle? Well, I wouldn't know what it's like <laughs> to work in a star vehicle. <laughs> so, or, I tell you, ideally, to me, everything should be an ensemble production, ultimately. I mean, even if something is, per se, cast as a star vehicle. I mean, whether or not... I mean, um, I haven't had the pleasure of, like, seeing... Uh, like something like um, Death of a Salesman with Dustin Hoffman. But I, I'll be so bold as to, to say that I would think even he would say, though I know that 99.9% .9 of the people ultimately, when they buy that ticket, they're going to go see that play because Dustin Hoffman is doing Death mm -hmm. of a Salesman. If tomorrow he left the show and he says, well, you know, 
Harry Smith has taken over the role, uh, there's going to be a lot of refunds. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> I, I know personally, because I do know other people in that show, mm -hmm. that ultimately what they're striving for is that ensemble feel. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't matter if, if it's the, the star name or whatever is drawing the people into the, the mm -hmm. building, whatever. But if it becomes a star turn, mm -hmm. In other words, where, where just that person is somehow upsetting the balance of the piece, and everybody else is kind of like left in the dust. You've not only destroyed the play. I mean, it's 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 just a whole other ball game. It's it's that really doesn't make any sense. So I guess what I'm trying to say is ultimately everything, in some degree, has to be somewhat of an ensemble, unless you're talking about a show that just has one person in it. As long as there's two people on that stage, instantly it's become an ensemble piece. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, and it has come to that time again when I have to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, audience, for being so splendid and so interested and so knowledgeable and to this exciting and marvelous panel that on their morning off could be doing all kinds of things from getting a mortgage to <laughs> getting their hair done or doing anything and whistling Dixie but have come to the American Theatre Wing seminars on working in the theatre. And the Wing, as most of you know, is a year-round organization. We're perhaps best known for the Tonys, but that's just one part of it. And the um, Tonys were named and for a woman, honored a woman named Antoinette Perry, who truly believed in knowledge in the theater, knowing your craft and continually to work at it. We at the Wing are trying to continue that through the sharing of knowledge and through the furthering of theater, wherever we can find it, whatever we can do, we will do theater. And so we bring shows to hospitals and to veterans' hospitals, Broadway and off-Broadway shows. We have the seminars that are on, we do a series of seminars twice a year, one on the performance and one on the play script and one on the production. And in the fall, the Joseph Maharam Awards are presented for design under the umbrella of the American Theater Wing. I'm president of the wing, and I couldn't do the things that I do without a wonderfully distinguished and able board. And on our seminar this, today is Brendan Gill, who is a member of the board, and Jean Dalrymple. I thank them very much for being here. <laughs>